Okay, folks. Hello there. Um, just first of all, thank you everybody for your responses or whoever did respond regarding the short videos. Uh, I do intend to do more. I might even do one tomorrow if I can get a chance. And um, I'm hoping that we'll make this a regular, a regular thing. So that is that's my hope and um if you find it useful then i'll continue doing so so um i had asked um various people who um, um some people wrote in after this short video and they asked the only disadvantage of it is can we ask any questions how are we going to ask questions i said just send me an email and i'll try and answer it so anyway i got an email today with uh with, with two good questions uh, regarding that short video but any other questions i'm also willing to take whatever questions you have uh, if i can answer them i will otherwise <laughs> i'll tell you i can't um or I'll look things up. So the first question is as follows. Is there a way to recognize a dream as divinely inspired and not just an ordinary dream, i.e. a personal subconscious desire or just a mix of random thoughts? This had to do with what I mentioned in the short, uh, in that short video about um, the idea of Ruach HaKodesh or divine inspiration, that there are five forms of it and the lowest form is through dreams. Prophetic dreams. Now, the way that you recognize that these dreams may be prophetic is if, first of all, there must be a call to action, right? There's got to be a call to action in um, either a call to action, which is the usual form, or a deep insight into something which you couldn't possibly have come to yourself. Then that is a sort of a prophetic dream. But usually it comes in the way of some kind of call to action and call to positive action. Obviously, if it's a call to negative action, uh, action that harms oneself or anybody else, that's obviously not a prophetic dream. That's, um, that's, <laughs> that's more of a nightmare, I would say, <laughs> but certainly not prophetic. Uh, so that's one of the ways in which we recognize a dream as divinely inspired and not just an ordinary dream. Um, we can see a similar uh, situation with, uh, with, with Pharaoh's dreams, when Pharaoh dreamed about the, fat, the sin cows swallowing the fat cows, and the sin stalks of wheat following the fat stalks of wheat. He knew that there was something he had to do. And um, therefore, all the, um, the interpretations of his khartumim, of his... Um, sorcerers and um, witches and so on and so forth who tried to interpret the dream uh, didn't sit well with him and until Joseph gave an interpretation and Joseph's interpretation is this is what you have to do, right? This is what you have to do. This is what the dream means and this is what you have to do. That's why he appointed Joseph to be his vizier, to be his uh, second in command because he understood and he realized that the main thing is the call to action, not just the, uh, not just the dream. So there you go. I hope that answers the first question. A uh, second question. Uh, um, I was looking, I, I'm not mentioning the names of the people who asked because um, I didn't ask them if I could mention their names. So I'm not mentioning. If uh, the person who asked the question doesn't mind the name being mentioned, just type OK in the, in the chat box and I'll know that, uh, that I can mention your name. In any event, um, the... Um, the person said that they were looking over the 14th chapter of the Gate of Reincarnations. Ah, okay. So Andrea just told me that it was fine with her that I mentioned and these. These two were Andrea's questions. So she was uh, looking over chapter 14 of the Gate of Reincarnations or Shar HaGilgulim. Shar HaGilgulim is a, is, a, is a work, one of the primary works written by the Arizal. Uh, one of the Shmone Sharim, one of the eight gates written by um, Rabbi Chaim Vital of the teachings. Rabbi Chaim Vital was the chief disciple of Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the, the, um, the Arizal, the um, founder of modern Kabbalah, essentially. And um, the, so she found in Shara Gilgulim, which discusses all the process and many, many examples of reincarnations, and she says, I think I'm not understanding 
what my soul is or who I am. Is my soul a mixture from others who have come before? And uh, so on. Okay, so let me just explain briefly what the concept of Gilgul, Gilgul or reincarnation or transmigration, as it's sometimes called, or transmogrification. There's all kinds of academic names for these things, which don't really have any meaning in my in my dictionary, but uh, whatever. They're called Gilgulim in, in Hebrew. Gilgul, um, uh, usually translated as reincarnation. So, what is the point of reincarnating? So, in we, we know that there's various philosophies, Eastern philosophies, um, which uh, Buddhist philosophies and so on, which also... Um, have some kind of concept of reincarnation, but their reincarnation is, see, is seen as either just that's the way things are, that life is constantly recycled, or that it's a punishment of some sort or another. Judaism sees it as, sees it as, 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 as neither of these two things. Right? In Kabbalah, the whole concept of Gilgul, of reincarnation, is an opportunity to rectify. It's an opportunity which is given to rectify. If a person has um, done certain things in his life or her life which require rectification, but the person for whatever reason did not manage to rectify them in their lifetime, so that unrectified aspect of the soul is once again reincarnated into uh, into a living um, into a living person become born as a, as a baby and so on or not necessarily but that's usually how it works um, and then the rectification hopefully will be done in the next uh, round however there is a limit to the amount of Gilgulim that um, that a person can experience if Gilgul doesn't work for after, after several attempts to rectify that thing, then another means of purification is used. Um, another means of purification, obviously not decided by us, but decided by uh, essentially by um, what you would call the heavenly court. Yeah, they decide that the soul has to be cleansed in a different way. And uh, there are various other forms of cleansing, which I'm not going to get into now. <clears throat> so, Gilgul, therefore, is essentially an opportunity. It's an opportunity to rectify and to improve what was done before, generally. There are certain cases, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the Levi Rizal explains, there are certain cases where one soul is brought back down into this world, is reincarnated again, for the sake not of its own tikkun, of its own rectification, but for the sake of tikkun of somebody else, to help somebody else along. And um, interestingly enough, this is one of the reasons that the soul of a woman can be reincarnated in order to help rectify her husband. I know all the, <laughs> all the ladies are smiling now, but that's what it says. Now, let me um, so let me so let me explain uh, what happens. Therefore, um, in the earliest generations of mankind, we're talking about Adam and the time of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. Then it was possible that an entire soul root would be brought into this world, and the person, if he was a righteous and saintly person, would rectify that entire soul root. But the truth is that there are only 600,000, for the Jewish people, there are only 600,000 soul roots. And those soul roots become subdivided as time goes on, as the generations uh, continue. Those soul roots become divided and subdivided and subdivided and subdivided. So it could happen that there are 20 people sitting in a room that are sharing one part of one soul root. Now, can it happen that a person has more than one aspect to rectify? Well, there's various levels of soul. Right? There's various levels of soul, as we know. There's five levels of soul. Nefesh, Ruach, Meshwam, Yechida. And um, the, the process of Gilgul 
of reincarnation really only affects or primarily affects the level of nefesh and perhaps ruach as well but primarily it affects nefesh the level of nefesh and um, the rectification therefore because the highest levels of soul chaya and yechida do not need rectification especially yechida the highest level of soul there's no concept of rectification necessary there why because it's called yechida liyachtach it's yechida which is an in constant communion with the creator in constant communion with uh, with god so the level of Yechida does not need rectification. The level of Chaya also does not need rectification, but nevertheless can be involved somewhat in the rectification of lower um, of lower levels. Now, it can happen that a person has more than one aspect to rectify in their lifetime. And this could be sometimes witnessed in uh, or understood in terms of um, a person's conflicting, sometimes conf conflicting desires. Conflicting desires might be the result of the animal soul, which we all have, contradicting the godly soul. But it could also come about uh, because of two different sparks which both need to be rectified. Now, this is fairly, it's fairly unusual that it happens like that, but it can happen. And um, uh, if things go wrong, if things go wrong, then it might be, uh, a person might be regarded as a sort of like a schizophrenic. Um, can be regarded as schizophrenic. Um, but the way it's usually done is that the group to which that soul root, into which that soul root, root subdivides, if one person doesn't do their work, then another soul takes over that job. A soul that has done their work but has not passed away yet, or is, at least is in the process of doing their work, they might take that over. Charlotte, and there's uh, the, the Rizal explains it on the, on the, on the uh, verse, Shalata Adam al Adam the Raloi that one person rules over the other to the detriment of the first one. When the first one is not doing his work, it could be that another soul will take over that work that he was supposed to do or that she was supposed to do. That could happen. So, um, so we can say share soul root, yes. That's the point of the other. I think, yeah, the higher soul parts don't need either. Great. Okay, so uh, I hope that answered that question. Good. All right, are there other questions? Um, are we really, really chosen as Jews and what, uh, and what for? And why is there no mention of Jews in the Bible? Look, every creature that's alive, every creature that's alive is chosen to be alive is chosen to live in this world. In other words, there's nothing that happens sort of randomly. There's no, you know, there's no random chance uh, by which a creature comes into being. This is, a, according to the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, very clear, even, even if we're talking about inanimate or animate, uh, you know, plant life or animal life, how much more so human life, that there, divine providence is revealed. Okay. So, nothing um, uh, is, is not in that sense chosen. However, every nation has its particular duty to perform, its particular function to perform. Jews are referred to in the Bible as Am Hanivchar, you know, the chosen people. They're referred to biblically as the chosen people. And the reason for that is because they're chosen for a certain function. What are they chosen to do? They're chosen to reflect the will of heaven down on earth. That's what they said they, they chosen for. Now, this is a big task. And um, it was something that was essentially chosen for us. That task was, was, was chosen for us by, essentially by Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, and um, 
when he said "naflinu ani va'amcha," separate us in this from this in in the in the sense separate us as a nation who um, are chosen to manifest the divine will in the world. Okay, so, but that's what that's so that's the choosing, so to speak, of the chosen people, if you want to put it that that way. Although again, all people, all everything that exists is chosen in a in one sense or another. And what are they chosen? What are the Jewish people chosen for? Well, I mentioned that in order to manifest godliness in the world. Why is there no mention of Jew in the Bible? Yeah, the, the, the word uh, Jew actually comes from the, from the Hebrew Yehudi, Yehudi, which means, um, translated as Jew, but is really from the tribe of Yehuda, the tribe of Judah. Why are Jews referred to as Yehudim, as Jews? rather than uh, anything else, because uh, Judah was really the only tribe that survived the destruction and subsequent exile, the destruction of the temple and subsequent exile of the Jewish people. The tribe that survived largely was the tribe of Judah. Yes, there were some tribes, uh, some Levites and the Kohanim, the high priest uh, sect and the, uh, the Levite tribe, the tribe of Levi also survived in part, and part of the tribe of Benjamin also survived, but all the rest were basically lost. All the other ten tribes were uh, were lost. And um, they were lost on the other side of the river called Sambation, and we don't really know where that is, but um, I had a friend actually in Israel who was doing a lot of research in uh, where the lost tribes could possibly have ended up. And interestingly enough, some of them uh, may, may be in, uh, in Africa, particularly North Africa. But um, in any event, let's not get into that now. Um, it's not really, um, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so um, let's just see now. So uh, there's no mention of the, Jews in, in the, of the word Jew in the Bible, you write. Um, they're called the Israelites, uh, B'nai Israel, the sons of or the descendants of Israel. Israel is Jacob. Yeah? Jacob was given the same the name Israel after he fought with the angel and overcame, etc. He was given the name Israel. Israel, And uh, we are ba- basically the sons of, or the descendants and the sons and daughters of Jacob. Jacob and his wives. So, um, okay, I hope that answers that. Uh, can a Jew come back as a non-Jew? Um, yes, yes, that can happen. In fact, a Jew can even come back as in on rare occasions, and for very unfortunate reasons, a Jew can even come back sometimes as that spark can sometimes be reincarnated in an animal. The famous story of the Baal Shem Tov that once the Baal Shem Tov was on a journey. And as often happened, uh, the coachman just let the reins go, and they um, and um, no, I'm sorry, uh, I'm mixing up uh, two stories. This story was the Baal Shem Tov was um, uh, he was he was walking. He wasn't on a coach. He wasn't on a, on a carriage or whatever. He was walking, and he was so absorbed in um, he was so absorbed in his own thoughts and in his own uh, whatever that um, he he walked for days and days and days, and uh, he didn't realize where he was. Eventually, landed up in a desert, and um, immediately he realized uh, when he realized that he was in this desert and desolate area. I don't know if it was completely a desert, but a completely desolate area. And um, and he realized that there must be a reason that he's there. And he looked around and he saw in front of him this very strange-looking frog. It was very big, first of all, and um, looked rather unusual. And it was kind of an unusual place to find a frog. <laughs> you usually find frogs by water, and this was a desert. So uh, he spoke to the frog, and he said to him, uh, what are you doing here? So the frog answered him and said that um, he's here because he was a soul that was involved in um, some very, very uh, bad things. And it all started off with not purifying his hands properly. There is a mitzvah, a commandment, to wash the hands before eating. 
before eating bread. And there's a special ritual way that you're supposed to do it, pouring three times on one hand, three times on the other hand. Water, you pour water three times on one hand, three times on the other hand. Some people have a custom of two and two. But in any event, uh, and he was mocking this, uh, this custom. Another version of the story says that he mocked the custom of rinsing your fingers off after you eat. It's called my macharoin in water, the, the after water, the water that you wash your fingers off with after the meal. And he was mocking for and scoffing at that for whatever reason. And uh, so his, uh, his punishment was to be Miss Galgel, to be reincarnated in this frog, which is a creature that loves water, but he was in a desert where he couldn't get, get to the water. So in other words, to make him thirst for and long for that water. Anyway, the Baal Shem Tov at that point in time rectified him and the frog died and that soul was able to ascend. And that's in fact why he had gotten into the desert. So you can see from this that um, the soul of a, um, uh, a, a soul spark can even be re- uh, incarnated into an animal and even into a non-kosher animal. Now, there is a, um, an expression in the uh, the sages have an expression about someone who converts to Judaism and he's called a ger shinit gayer, a convert who converts, literally translated. So the question is asked, why does a convert who converts say a non-Jew who converts? Uh, why a convert who converts? Uh, he's not a convert until he converts. So why a convert to the console? The Baal Shem Tov answers and says, no, this this soul was always the soul of a convert. In other words, it was, so, it was a, a Jewish soul that was incarnated into a non-Jewish body for whatever reason. And um, the person had to find their way back. Uh, and therefore it says, a, a, a convert who converts. He was already converted. In other words, it was already a Jewish soul. And you very often find that um, amongst the greatest of the sages are people who are actually converts. The teachers of Hillel and Shammai, whose names were Shmaya and Avtalion, were actually converts. Very, very great, very great sages, amongst the greatest of the sages, Shmaya and Avtalion. There was another uh, sage, Rabbi Meir, who was also from converted uh, family. And um, um, many, many others. One of my teachers in Israel, when I was a student in Israel, one of my uh, great teachers was also someone who converted to uh, converted to Judaism. Very great man, very uh, inspirational, very deep thinker, and very uh, tremendous amount of uh, how do you say uh, perspicacity, <laughs> insight. <laughs> okay, so that uh, answers that question, I hope. Um, uh, okay, anybody else? Any other questions? What is a soul root? Well, a soul root is all soul roots actually come from Adam originally. There was only one soul originally, one human soul originally, and that was Adam. Uh, Eve was part of Adam until they were divided. That is called Nesira, the process of Nesira, where Adam and Eve became two separate entities. And the reason for that was so that now they could unite uh, and create a third entity. As they were one entity, they couldn't possibly unite. You can't have one thing uniting. It has to be two disparate, two different things uniting. So anyway, Eve was separated from Adam. And all their progeny... And uh, humankind from then on are basically um, uh, derived originally from Adam. They all derived from Adam's soul. And there's 600,000 soul roots that derived from there originally. Now, interestingly enough, um, generally the souls of um, the souls of the righteous, the souls of tzaddikim, of saintly people in most cases were one of two types of souls. Souls that left Adam before he committed the sin, eating the fruit of a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And um, those souls fled from him before um, 
before he uh, before he committed the sin. So when those souls come into incarnation, they're called new souls. They're called new because they, they, they fled from Adam before the sin. And since everything after the sin is basically old, they're called new souls because they never really um, partook of that process of death. However, there are other souls which are completely new souls, which weren't even part of Adam originally. Baal Shem Tov testified that the soul of Rabbi Shneer Zalman Vliadi, the author of the Tanya, the, um, the founder of the Chabad movement, of the Lubavitch movement, so Rabbi Shneer Zalman Vliadi, the Baal Shem Tov said about him that his soul was a completely new soul that had never ever before been in, uh, reincarnated, not in Adam and not ever. Completely new soul. And those are much, much, much rarer. Very, very few of those souls. And there, those souls come into the world in order to provide a completely new approach to, uh, to understanding Torah and very often understanding Kabbalah. The Baal Shem Tov said of himself that he was the reincarnation of Rabbi Saadia Gaon. Right? Rabbi Saadia Gaon. Rabbi Saadia Gaon was a 10th century sage, a very great sage. Uh, from the 10th century, who was one of the leading lights of the Gaonic period. The Gaonic period was a period from about um, probably the 7th century till the 11th century, approximately. No, from the uh, 700s till the 1100s, I'm sorry, from the 8th century till the, um, till the 1100s, the Gaonic period. So he was one of the great Gaoni. One of the Gaon means a genius, really, but that's... Um, that was the, the Baal Shem Tov said that his soul was the soul of Rav Sadia Gaon. But that may have been just one spark of his soul, one aspect of his soul, who knows. Um, we're not able to, um, at least I'm not able to know at this point in time. <laughs> okay. Other questions? An animal can graduate and graduate to human form um, as and remain an animal? Probably not. Um, probably not. The spark would then be subsumed into an animal, into a human being, right? And the spark of the animal, the spark that is trapped there, and this is being, this is really trapped. This is unfortunately um, when a human soul is in an animal's body, um, it is trapped and can't express itself completely obviously and therefore um it um it's it's a state of being trapped and when um when that soul exits from the animal uh it, it usually enters some kind of human form or if the tikkun is done completely then it just simply um ascends up above uh, doesn't eating an animal elevate its soul? It elevates the animal soul, but it doesn't elevate the soul of the of uh, a human soul that was trapped in the animal body. It elevates the animal soul. Yeah. Which is why, which is why eating um, eating of animals um, is there's all kinds of restrictions as to what animals can be eaten, how they can be uh, slaughtered and processed and so on and so forth in order to be able to elevate that spark. If one does not slaughter the animal but it's just killed, then that elevation doesn't take place. Uh, the elevation will not take place. Um, All right, any other questions? Regarding the soul subdivision, if I understand it, it's possible to have two parts in one lifetime with two different tikkun to work on, but of the same root, please correct me if I'm wrong, not necessarily of the same root. It can be of the same root, yes, particularly if you're doing somebody else's work that they refused to do or that they didn't manage to do. Um, but it could be that a person can have two soul roots as well. Yeah, two, uh, two sparks from two different soul roots. It's unusual, but it can happen, yes. So, 
In other words, of two different tikkunim. Yes. You usually find with those kinds of people um, that they have to, and they have interests which are, um, I wouldn't say necessarily um, uh, contradictory, but which just like don't seem to fit together at all. Um, you know, from two different ends of the spectrum of, of human interest, like for example, um, uh, someone who might be very deeply involved, let's say, in mathematics, <laughs> and another, per- and at the same time be very interested in psychology, <laughs> just for by by way of example, two completely different like uh, branches of uh, that might be coming from two different sources, from two different sparks. <clears throat> Um, doesn't matter where you are buried and how you are buried and why is this um, well yes it does matter where a person is buried and uh, how they are buried okay so what does burial actually do what is the purpose of burial what is the purpose of being uh, put into the ground after a person dies we don't believe in cremation uh, but why is it that we are put into, because um, uh, we, we come from the dust and we return to the dust. Tashuf, we return to the dust uh, from which we were created. In other words, we, um, um, that, that, that recycling process of the body, so to speak, does take place. However, there is, there remains in the bones for a certain period of time, uh, there remain, remains a certain... Um, identity of the person. Uh, there was some uh, it's called the havla de garme. Uh, it's the like the, the breath in the bones, literally, right? The breath in the bones. In other words, a certain spark of the person remains in the grave, and therefore the burial place uh, where the where that person is buried has, should be amongst those of his kin, uh, those of his kin, or those of his tribe, or those of his nation. Um, because each nation nation has its own um, um, function and its own tasks and duties and so on and so forth, and therefore one should be buried in uh, together with one's compatriots. Uh, in other words, Jews should be buried in a Jewish ceremony and uh, uh, ceremony and cemetery, and uh, Christian people should be buried there with together with Christians, Muslims, Muslims, and so on and so forth. Also, how one is buried is, yes, important. Um, it is the custom of, uh, of Jews to be very, Orthodox Jews anyway, to be buried in very, very simple shrouds and a very simple coffin. No decorations, no, um, no carvings, no, um, uh, no, no paintings, nothing fancy. You know, it's supposed to be completely, absolutely simple in white linen um, shrouds. And um, after having um, purified the body with a mikveh, the, the, the body is usually put into a mikveh. A mikveh is a pool of water, uh, sometimes translated as a ritualarium. <laughs> um, so uh, the body is purified um, and then wrapped in shrouds and then put in a very plain wooden coffin with no nails and no um, sort of kept together by dowels. Uh, in Israel, uh, they do not bury the body in a coffin. They just bury the body in the shrouds. Um, they don't use a coffin. A coffin is only outside of Israel. And um, there are usually burial grounds. Uh, I suppose you could call them sacred burial grounds where um, people are buried. Again, in Israel, this Mount of Olives, Harazetim, uh, Haramanuchot is another place, the uh, mountain of uh, eternal rest, I suppose you could say it's called. Um, Haramanuchot is a cemetery, big cemetery. Um, interestingly enough, <laughs> I had a friend who uh, had an apartment, he bought an apartment that overlooked the... Um, the cemetery, the cemetery was on a hill, like far away, like maybe like three miles away or maybe more, yeah, about three miles away. 
but you could see it out of his living room window. So, <laughs> so uh, someone once asked him, uh, oh, doesn't it bother you to, uh, you know, to have your window overlooking the cemetery? So he says, no, it does me a lot of, uh, does me a lot of good actually. It's very good for me because, you know, I think of what's going to be in the end and I do what I have to do now. <laughs> That's, you know. Okay. So, um, how does a priest become impure by being near a dead body? What exactly is happening? That's a kind of a complicated question, but basically when a, when a body, when, when, the, when the soul leaves the body, the body becomes Tommy. The body becomes ritually impure. And even though the body is purified by being in the mikvah, a kohen, a, one of the priestly tribe, is not allowed to have any dealings with a dead body because it does transfer impurity. Um... Okay, uh, it's a a Tuma and Tara, very complicated issues. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of details, but that's basically the idea. Uh, Second question from Andrea. If the dead are buried in just a shroud, then when they resurrect after Mashiach comes, after Messiah comes, won't they need to get clothes real fast? (laughs) Yeah, they'll have a Macy's right next to the, uh, (laughs) right next to the cemetery. (laughs) Um... I thought people would have the clothes they were buried in. They were buried in shrouds, so they'll get up with the shrouds and then uh, they'll trot over with the Macy's, I suppose, and um, and um, buy themselves the latest Levi's. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what people will wear then, but um, I guess we'll have to find out. Um, okay, so... Won't the clothes right away? Yeah, then they probably will, yeah. But um, I don't know. Maybe there'll be fig leaves that we'll use, you know. They've been used before. <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll worry about it when again when we get there. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, um, if there are no other questions, then we'll just call it a night. Um, okay, all right, folks. Um, I hope that I will be able to, that I'll make the time tomorrow morning to make another short video. So watch out for it, I'll send you the link. Um, but the best way to do it is just to sign up, um, subscribe on the YouTube channel and uh, then the link will get you automatically it'll let you know that you're um, that you're that there's a new video so have a good night everybody and have a great weekend a great sabbath to all the great shabbat shabbat shalom to all of you who uh, keep the sabbath uh, good shabbos uh okay very very good and we will be in touch hopefully next week see you all